Now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's session. Please join me in welcoming post-production uh, supervisor, John Silva. This can come off now, right? <laughs> uh, thank you for that. And how about that video? Thank you to, to the PGA for that as well. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. First, we have Amanda Beggs, whose credits include Lady Bird and Finding Oana. Kurt Sobel, MPSE, whose credits include Ray and Ghostbusters Afterlife. Michael Minkler, whose credits include Chicago and Black Hawk Down. And Brent Finley, whose credits include Ted Lasso and We Crashed. Hi, everyone. There's a quote from Steven Spielberg in the video that we just watched that we allow audiences to see with our ears. I'm just kind of curious for the panel, what are some things that you heard at some point along the way that inspired you to pursue this wonderful world of sound and music? We going in order? <laughs> sure. Um, I, I guess for me, it actually wasn't so much, um, because I'm a production sound mixer, so um, so much of what you hear, obviously, is so many different hands that have you know created the final product. The production sound mixer is just simply one of them. Um, but for me, growing up, my parents always made us stay through the credits, and it was just the uh, recognition of seeing some of the same names over and over again on some of my favorite films, and just beginning to realize, like that, those to me became the sort of benchmark of where I wanted to you know, see myself and, and Luckily, a lot of those names that I was looking at are now mentors, which is really incredible. But for me, it was the people. It was the production sound mixers whose names I would just see over and over again and be like, how do you get to be there? So for me, it was the people. Uh, for me, uh, I, I thought about this question. I, I uh, feel very fortunate to have grown up in a, in a suburb of Detroit uh, that was very musical and... Um, and film centric, my family as well. We, we spent every weekend at the movies. When I was younger, I remember my mother dropping my brother and I off for a Saturday matinee around noon and not picking us up till dinner and us going from theater to theater to watch a movie. Um, my, my high school, every dance, uh, the, there were players, uh, members, students above me in the upper grades. Uh, like Don was, who's a record producer, and Doug Feiger from the Knack. They were one or two years older than me. My entire elementary school, junior high and high school, uh, was filled with music, and, and Motown and the Beatles, and, and the name Jerry Goldsmith and John Barry and Henry Mancini. If I saw those names in, in, a, in an ad in the newspaper, I went straight to the theater to look at that. So for the lo as long as I can remember, music was a part of my life, and I'm, I'm so fortunate still to be able to have somehow turned that into a career all these years and fostered that love of music in film and, and combining the two. And that's what inspired me to, to move out here, drive cross country, and uh, pursue this career. Yeah, well, um, I come from a family of filmmakers as well, sound people. And uh, so, yes, we loved films. We would always go to the f movies. And it was those earlier in the 60s, those big films that had the big sound that, that really impressed me and, and, and made me want to continue on doing sound. It was, you know, pictures like uh, The Great Escape and The uh, Lawrence of Arabia, West Side Story. Uh, those things, you know, blew my mind as a young man. And, and so I knew, it was without question, I knew what I was going to be doing by the time I was 12 years old. And I actually have, I started working full time when I was 17 and I haven't stopped. So I, I, I found what I wanted to do. And he's very good at it. <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah, I think some inspirations that, that, that turned turn me on to the world of sound, I would have to say 2001 Space Odyssey. And if, if anything, that was an exploration of the absence of sound and what being alone with um, the environment around you can be just as powerful storytelling as wall-to-wall -wall sound in, in some big event. So. 2001 Space Odyssey, then probably Close Encounters of Third Kind, um, 
the original The Right Stuff movie, Days of Thunder. As I, as I was getting older, it blew my mind, the sound of Days of Thunder. I thought it was awesome. So, and then on to Saving Private Ryan was just, just cracked it open for me. And that was about the beginning of, of my career in, in doing something with sound purposefully as opposed to just being a hobby up to that point. And so that really um, kind of kicked things off. It was amazing. So, Very cool. Thanks for that. Um, I'm curious if you could talk about preparation for a project when you start to think about joining a project, when you actually do engage with the, the, the filmmakers. You know, you have so many relationships that you have to cultivate over the course of a piece. You have the, the director, you have the editor, the composer, the producers, the studio. When do those relationships ideally begin for you? And how do you kind of use those relationships to your advantage um, to create the ultimate, the optimal end product? Well, uh, Anyone, I think we have to st start with um, getting involved with the film as soon as possible. Uh, I think anyone will tell you that. We have a production mixer here. She wants to be involved. She wants to see the script and know where they're going to shoot and what the problems are. She's got to solve the problems before she gets to the set. Uh, television re-recording mixer. He's got to, he's got all this stuff coming down the pike at rapid speed. He's got to have the right tools and the time to do what he needs. And the music, uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, 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 things to say about this, but the music preparation can start in pre-production, right? Uh, absolutely, uh, certainly with a musical, and I and I work on a lot of musicals uh, through the years. And it's great when I'm able to come on during the recording of the pre-records, work in the studio with the musicians and the director to make sure that the script is covered and that everything is, is what we need to shoot to, which is, which is crucial, of course. And without that, without that uh, presence, then something could be missed. And um, in the case of Ray, for instance, uh, there were many, many uh, scenes in the script uh, that needed to be re-recorded because they didn't exist. Stop, stops and starts of certain songs that we did directly with Ray and a, a select group of musicians that, that he wanted to work with. Otherwise, we couldn't have shot certain scenes uh, in that movie. And as a music editor, I was there the entire time working with him in the studio and visits from Jamie Foxx to make sure that we got what we needed. So coming on early on a musical is, is critical, of course, uh, as a music editor in any kind of musical that you're going to do. And, and a typical dramatic film, um, I love coming on near the end of the shoot. And there are certain directors that I work with who bring me on that early, whether it was Ivan Reitman or Taylor Hackford or even Michael Mann calling me months before... Uh, uh, post starts to say, I want to send you a scene, you know, find some temp music for me that I can, that I can help cut to. And, um, and coming on early in those situations is of great value as well, because you're helping to lay the foundation for what the direction uh, might become for the director and the editor uh, in terms of who you want to choose as a composer. I mean, it's interesting. I've been brought on some projects six months in advance before principal photography. I start having initial calls with producers or director letting me know that there's a project coming down the pipeline. And then other times it's been three weeks before principal photography starts shooting. Um, so it depends. But the earliest I can get the script is ideal because that, like like you were saying, Mike, is um, that script is really going to inform a lot of, of my prep um, because you know even if I get to go on scouts or get to have you know conversations with all the different department heads a lot of the times, um, there's the, the movie that they're planning on shooting, there's the movie they actually shoot, you know, and then the movie that gets edited. But um, you have to be ready. I can prep all I want, but it's more so about being able to make decisions in the moment um, and being prepared for whatever's going to throw my way. I did a movie in which, you know, had a conversation with the director and producers in advance and was told very explicitly, while scenes took place next to water, our cast would never get fully wet. Fantastic. That cast was soaking wet every single scene near the water. So the plan that I had brought was not the plan that would work. So I just had to pivot and come up with something that would work. And, you know, just on the fly in a foreign country <laughs> without a lot of, you know, access to things we have access here. But that, that's what it is. is it's, you can prep as much as you want for my particular job, but it's about bringing more than you bring everything with the kitchen sink and being prepared or being able to make something or just get creative with solutions because prep really only takes you so far when it comes to being on set and production. 
Yeah, and then in uh, episodic, um, which is you know, primarily the realm I work in, as a supervising sound editor, I don't know from from where I sit if it's if there's ever a too early time to get involved. Um, but I also understand there's bigger fish to fry well before the post process. So sometimes that's a thought that you know, do we need to engage post sound so early? But even if it's just the getting in contact with the supervising sound editor early on, uh, we can head off a lot of um, efficiency things later on. So, for example, connect with your supervising sound editor early and see if this post house you're working with has a sound librarian that can feed your assistant picture editor from day one licensed sound effects that won't have to be replaced later because we can't get them officially. So there's nothing like getting a turnover and all the sound effects were ripped from YouTube. And it's like, those are great, but we have to try to duplicate that because everyone loves them, but we actually can't use those. So now we're, um, instead of elevating the project, we're just trying to get back to zero where we can go from there. So some of those communications way up front can uh, just head off the creative issues later where everybody can just go. And it's like, this is what we want and it's great, it works, let's use it. And, and I think as, as much as we need to have time to prepare for things, we are also really good problem solvers because things get thrown at us constantly all the time. And so as, as producers, uh, it's best to uh, head off these problems before they become too big, before they come out of control. Uh, I'm in feature films. The, our biggest problem is, is visual effects because that is very hard to control. But, uh, and so we have to change what we're, our, our schedule of, of things that we're gonna be doing that day constantly be to, to accommodate the changes in visual effects. However, there's a, a number of things you can do as a producer, and that is to give people more time and give people, uh, you know, t time to think about what it is that they're that they're going to be doing, and think about what's what's uh, what's next in the process, so that the th these things don't pile up at the end of the line, which is at the mix. That leads me to a, a question just about, you know, Mike talking to the, the producers, a room full of producers in the room today. Um, how do you find it, it easiest or best to engage? How do, you, how do you advocate for yourself, I suppose, you know, when you are you know, wanting to come on as early as possible? How, is, is it through an agent? Is it through you contacting the producers directly? Is it through relationships that you've already had with the filmmakers, et cetera? Uh, what, what would you say to the producers in the room today to say, to, to make your case? Let me start, you know, day one. <laughs> well, what I would say is it's all about trust. Obviously, uh, working with a for your for the first time with any particular director or producer or studio for that matter um you we there's going to be a certain amount of time that i have to gain their trust and that could take a day and it could take a week hopefully not ever more than a week but once i've gained their trust they'll allow me to do what i need to do to serve them see my job is to make everybody happy everybody who's in the mix whether you're a, a dialogue editor a, a sound effects editor a music editor a, a composer a picture editor a director or a producer uh, my job is to make everybody happy if they all get what they want then i've done my job uh i, I just need i need the time and i need to gain their trust and so repeat customers come, that's how I get, you know, most of my jobs is on repeat customers because they know that they don't have to wrangle me and my ideas, that I'm, I'm going to be thinking about their ideas. And so a lot of these, a lot of times, uh, my directors won't show up for six or eight weeks. And they've allowed me that much time to, to do my job, knowing that I'm going to do what, pretty much what they're thinking. And I think that can probably be said for all these people here. Yeah, and I think it's starting that relationship as early as possible, whether that's just a phone call to introduce myself um, uh, and, and maybe get a contact list from the post uh, producer where we can, I can then interface with the production sound mixer to just open that dialogue well up front. So from then on, it's at least a warm contact if there's a question. You, you know, you have a face with a name with a person that can maybe answer, like, how is this uh, scene going to be approached? How are you going to approach the scene in post? Just a quick little question, a 30-second question, a five-minute phone call um, way early on um, can
can inform a lot of decisions that are made later. So, um, so fostering that relationship. What I love is getting an email from a post producer uh, going into season two, the day they walk in their office for the first time for that season two that says, hey, just let you know, office is open around the way. I'm not gonna see anything for six months. But to, to knowing that the line of communication is open right out of the box is fantastic. Cause then we can, there's, there's no problem with, hey, we, word on the set was the scene was tough. Shoot me the dailies. I'll check them out. Say, yeah, it's tough, but we can get it. Don't worry about it. Well, th we have the tools to, f to fix this, you know. And so, you know, we hear the phrase "fix it and post." Everybody's like, "Oh, geez," but please leave some of that for us because half my job is that. So don't fix it all in production. So, <laughs> I mean, I I get brought on if I if it's a new producer. I mean, I think like Mike was saying, a lot of my jobs now are, are repeat. Um, producers have the you know a core group of people that that I work with, but those the first job that I ever had with them was really important, and that's what re led to me you know getting called back for other things is because we did build up that relationship. For me as a production mixer, the core thing is to show that I'm not there to make their lives more difficult or to complain about a noisy location or to complain about anything. I mean, I'm there to capture performance, and I get asked all the time like, oh, is this going to be a problem for you? It's a problem for the show, and it's a problem for the movie. It's a problem for the episode. Um, my job is to fix it as much as possible, but you know, I'm I'm there to serve the director, there to serve you know the project as a whole. And I think when I can manage to sell that, when I can I can convince producers that's that's you know what what my goal is. It's not to be a troublemaker, but this is going to help you out. You are going to be grateful that we took the five minutes. You're going to be grateful that we moved from this corner of the room over to this corner of the room away from the air conditioning unit. That that's going to help serve you. And once I manage to build that level of trust, that they realize I'm not there just to be you know the complaining crabby sound mixer. I'm there because this is for your benefit. And once I've and I've been lucky enough to to build that relationship with certain producers and they know that if I come to them with a concern, it's not just because I want to be a problem. It's because I want to solve their problem that they just weren't aware of yet. Um, so that's key. That's what leads to the repeat jobs is that building of trust. And it has to happen I mean, it, over the course of whether it's the whole movie or the course of the whole season, but hopefully by the end of it, I've convinced them that if I'm raising my hand and coming to you with a concern, um, it's not to make me happy. It's because it's going to make you happy. <laughs> I could dovetail on the end of that. On the, on the back side of that as a solution, um, it's heartbreaking to be in ADR and see a performance that the director loves, the, the actor poured some emotion they uh, tapped into something in their life that allowed them to get this performance and we're ADRing it for technical reasons and the, just the blood goes out of their face and it's like I'm going to do everything I can to save production this is a safety um, but you know had it been at least you know we try to fight for it and they fight for it on the stage but to see where oh at the end we're like oh yeah that's right oh yeah, we should have expected this because of what was happening on the day that we waved off. You know, And some stuff you just can't control that. You have to pick your battles. Um, but just that's the backside of, you know, you're risking the performance. We want to protect what the actors are putting out in front of the camera at whenever we can. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is to emphasize two of the things that were brought up is that for me, in terms of dealing with the music and the directors and producers that I work with and editors, uh, it, it's to fulfill their vision. And I think someone alluded to that. I have no ego about what I'm delivering, the ideas that I have, whether they're good or bad. I'm there and they're hiring me because we've either worked together before and they know what to expect. Uh, and it could be outside of what they're thinking or something more traditional, but they're depending on me to come up with something that is of value either way. And I like that. I like that not everything I'm presenting is immediately accepted because that's not why I'm, I'm uh, there to do my job. I'm there to figure out what is best for them to, to achieve their vision of what, they're, of what they're thinking they want. And that's a discovery process. And that for me is the most exciting. To be uh, in a room, I, I'm thinking offhand of the way back that I did uh, two years ago before Ghostbusters, where we had 24 music meetings dealing only with the score and picture changes. And you know, with four people in the room, the director, the editor, the composer, myself, um, pretty much on a weekly basis, going through demos and directions and, and how something should be edited both pic pictorially as well as with the, with the demos that were coming in. 
and it's just something that that continues to excite me those kinds of relationships and the producers are there to support that process as and they have and that's when it seems to be the most successful too when you know who is in charge and who you're uh, working for uh, and who's driving the 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 final decisions and then amongst themselves they can decide if that's really what they want to do but to have that initial um, relationship with those people is critical for for what I'm doing in order to be successful for them. Yeah, John, I'd like to bring up the subject of budget because speaking to a room of producers, uh, um, I have to say the the question I find the most ridiculous in filmmaking is uh, asking a post sound team, "Give me a budget for this movie." when all we've got is a script to go by. And it, we don't know what the post budget could be because we don't know the scope. We haven't talked to anybody. We haven't seen where are you going to shoot this, this movie. Who, we haven't spoken to the director about uh, the scope in which he, you know, the, the, is it going to be really lavish? Is it going to be using three cameras, nine cameras? Or how much footage are they shooting? Um, uh, so we, uh, the action sequences are they extremely difficult, and um, how many of them are there? Even though the script says, you know, it could be a two-liner on the script about something that's going to happen, and it ends up that it's two weeks worth of shooting, just to shoot whatever you know. As the script gets evolved and the and the filming process evolves, things get bigger and and, and crazier. So to hold us to a budget uh, six months before you've shot and edited the film we haven't seen it is is pretty ridiculous now give us some parameters yes we can read the script and we can say it's a comedy we can say it's an action film we can say it's a musical and we can say well the parameters you know we can do it for, we we think we can do it for this hopefully uh if it comes into two hours what if it comes into three and a half hours in length um uh, so just give us the parameters, and, and, and you have to be flexible. With, uh, with us, we are professional. We know how to get out of problems. Uh, we know how to deal with anything that comes our way, and the, everything does come our way, and we'll stick to uh, those parameters as best we can. But uh, to, to pressure us to, make a, to answer that question, uh, you know, give me a budget, you know, months before you've even shot the film is pretty ridiculous. Speaking of budget, what are some things that you all collectively wish, and this is really for the producers here in the room with us today, that producers would always consider when establishing their budgets and when they first approach you uh, to, to be engaged, the sound and music teams? What are, yeah, what, what's the, the dream list? <laughs> I would love to answer this question. Um, Things evolve in this industry all the time, things change, and just because we've always done it one way does not necessarily mean that that is currently the best way to do things. And I bring that up because in my particular um, field, we're very used to having a three-person sound team on set. Production sound mixer, boom operator, sound utility person. That is no longer the best way to do things. We need a fourth person. And I've been fighting this fight for a couple of years now, um, winning it sometimes, losing it a lot of the times. But it really just needs to be established that based on how we shoot things now, we need a fourth person because the workload has increased. Um, we need a person whose sole job it is to focus on wiring up talent because it is a full-time job. You want them to go to base camp and wire? We need a fourth person. I mean, you want to wire on every single cast member, 14 people because we're shooting with three cameras to make our day? We need a fourth person. So that to me is it's the makeup of the department that's a really hard fight because I get it because everyone looks and they go, but three has worked for so long. Why do you need a fourth? Our last guy didn't need a fourth. Your last guy did need a fourth. He just didn't ask you for it because I guarantee you that every, you would work so much more efficiently. You would get such a better product out of it and the money to be spent. I mean, I'd rather that these guys have more money to work on the creative side of things than to bother with cleaning up, you know, the fact that, you know, we had a scratchy love because I didn't have someone who could get in and fix it, you know or ADR something because we couldn't have three booms in the air like we needed to cover the scene. Um, so to me, I'd rather, I'd rather the money be, better money be spent for them if a little bit more money can spend, be spent up front in production. Fourth 
person. Yeah, and part of that is in in post getting the dailies and seeing all the breakdowns of the mics. When I see boom two, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be nice. That person wired up 14 people and then jumped in and boomed a 30 minute long continuous take, and had to figure out their shadows and figure out where to stand with no time at all. That that we that's it's it's gets to be inhumane sometimes on certain shows, the work that we give to that sound utility person. It's why it oh. needs to be two people. Oh, so we're, when I say boom two, it doesn't mean there was a fourth person. Nope. Oh. That's the third person <laughs> doing two jobs. Gotcha. <laughs> but thank you, anyway. <laughs> well, I think the same can be said for the age of computers. You know, I am old enough to have worked on film, and, and uh, when we switched, well, we didn't, there was never a switch to digital. It was a, about a 15 year slow process that was miserable. <laughs> but the, the thing that's, that started, the conversation that started was now that we're digital, we can do it faster. You can cut picture faster, wrong. And you can cut sound faster, wrong. But because you can cut picture faster, uh, just meant that the directors can make more decisions. And they will make five times more decisions than they had to when they were on film, because they can. And the same thing goes for sound. It just, it, there's so much you can do with, with uh, digital editing and digital mixing. Uh, it's not faster. It's because you can do so much more, it takes five times longer. Yet our budgets keep shrinking and the manpower is cut. I mean, it, you know, we used to have you know, five man crews, now we're down to two man crews. It's the same type of thing. It's like, uh, it's, it, it's not easier. It's we can do a single task faster, but the overall it just means there's more time to make more decisions That's what I was gonna say, but he said he said it much more eloquently I, What I what I want to add to that is that because of that the expectation is that the movie is going to be ready sooner and and what we've lost is the ability to sit with the film and to screen it, to have temp screenings, to have internal screenings, and to really determine over a certain length of time, is the picture change that we made, or the sound change, or the cue, or the music cue that was changed, is that better for the film, or did that pull us back and take us in a direction we didn't want? Um, a great example is on Born Ultimatum. We were cutting that so quickly in order to make a, a deadline uh, for release, which, of course, all pictures have to get released. We're, we're working toward that deadline, and we loved working on that film. We never had time to screen it with, for an audience, but we would have internal screenings, and we would go down to that room in Ocean uh, and the PCH, um, I forget the name of that screening room, uh, Ocean Screening Room, maybe. Ocean Avenue Screening Room. Ocean Avenue Screening Room. And, and just for editorial, because as a music editor, I'm on every film working directly with editorial next to them in their rooms. Uh, sound effects is usually off in other offices. And we're there looking at it for ourselves just to be able to determine is this working or not? And we never had an opportunity to show that to an audience ahead of time. Fortunately, it didn't, you know, uh, reap havoc for, for acceptance by the audience. And and ended up being a, a popular film, but um, we were under a crunch of, of having to make these quick changes and, and still make the release date and not being able to sit with the film. Um, when, when I was on Heat, Michael, would, we would screen that movie, which was like a three-hour movie, every second or third day at 7 a.m. in the morning. That's the start of our day, just internally, for us to see if whatever changes, which were massive, we, we were doing, were working for him. And we've sort of lost that ability to do that because of this, uh, this compressed schedule and the wonderful quickness that digital editing has allowed us to, uh, to achieve. There are a few, I think, you know, concrete things that um, up front, just being aware of helps the, the post pro process. And I'm speaking from, especially from a, an episodic standpoint, because our producers are, are, are keepers of time and space. And I understand we've got, we are dictated, we have a deadline. Um, and, and, you know, streamers, the streaming world has kind of changed when that deadline is. It's like nothing is done until it's all done. We can go back in and, and, and tweak and modify. Some way at times that's a, that's a saving grace. We realized by episode seven, 
we baked a timeline in an episode three that now doesn't work. But well, we can just go back in episode three and fix it. We can just now we can be ambiguous. We don't have to give a date. We can say in a couple of weeks or something and changes it. So um, so that part of the process, I, I really enjoy the streaming process because we kind of kind of do feature storytelling in digestible bites. Um, but I also love the pace of that. Uh, but in the sense, we don't ever finish. We just run out of time, right? <laughs> it's like it's got to go. Um, so, but some concrete things up front are just, um, maybe being, a, making sure everyone's aware that not all of the cast has ADR in their contract. So your primary people do, but we could get secondary tertiary. So when we're in a spotting session and the director says, Ooh, I'd like to get the bus driver to say, sit down. That's a $2,500 line. Could that, that's two days of sound editorial. Now, I'm not saying I, I, I have a better use of it for the money. I'm just saying just understand what's at stake when that, if that line isn't, if that actor doesn't have ADR in their contract, that's over and above, you know. And I know you got stuff, buffers built in. It's not me to s tell you where to spend the buffer. but <laughs> um, And then that also leads to um, the, the schedules in the sense that when you're creating a schedule, let's talk up front. Let's get the scripts. Or let's get sample shows. Like wh what is a show that's out there that you like that you see as the soundscape the similar soundscape. Are we going to be dreaming designing? Are our flashbacks concrete? Are our flashbacks in an ethereal world? You know, what's uh, where do we want to go with this? Because I could speak to how much time we're going to have to end up devoting for sound design. Do we need a sound designer? Car chases. Well, I've got a guy that cuts cars, right? Not everybody can cut cars. So there's um, things like that. Those discussions up front, they'll allow us to still hit our budget, still hit our deadline. Um, but we didn't find out five days before it mixes that this is what the need was. So in I know episodic, it's a quick turnaround. Um, but if we get out in front of those, the awareness of that, part of that relationship is, and the trust that you, you talk about is, that's have that open line of communication of, if I know what your soundscapes you like, what we're going for ahead of time, and I see this coming down the pike, uh, we can talk about what, how that's, is that going to even impact our mix? You know, are we okay for the mix? Do we have to push playback? Um, because I don't ever want to do that. Uh, so if we can back time it, so when you're making your schedules, um, sometimes the, I, I don't know what the motivation is for creating the most compact schedule that you can, but also if I could advocate for start, have your first schedule be as broad as you can, because no matter how, I feel like no matter how tight we start, we still compress, compress, compress. So if we give it a place to go, we still land in a manageable, manageable spot by the time we have to deliver. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned the notion of an ADR line costing $2,500. And, and I think that, you know, collectively, you know, kind of a message that is being you know, related very directly here is that it really does start, you know, with the producers, you know, from moment one with pen to paper on a budget. And a lot of choices have to be made, of course, when, you know, crafting the sound and music budgets. But it doesn't mean that sound just because aside from production sound of course um, it comes at the end of the process that it should that it, 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 it should never be an afterthought because every choice that is made on set does impact the entirety of the shoot and of the post process and of the eventual distribution um so producers in the room uh you know <laughs> listen to them <laughs> it'll make you know, your lives you know so so much easier you know along the way of course too and um speaking of our producers in the room i i'm kind of curious you know we have producers of all levels and you know, um people who have you know done their first feature films or many feature films or people who are just starting out trying to figure out the uh the landscape of the producing world do you have any advice for our our more junior or you know aspiring producers and how to find and build these sound crews because you know so much of the sound team you, know, you spend the time in the shadows and like you're in a, in a dark office we never see you and i, I the post supervisor i never see the sound team except for you know, when we're on the mix stage um how do they find you how do they find people who are also starting to build a career as, as phenomenal phenomenal as yours all have been well, I'm so, could we, Any advice? What's the, what's the well, question? What would you tell an aspiring producer? <laughs> oh, you know, what would you tell? Yeah, yeah. How, how do they find a, a great production sound mixer? How do they find a great music supervisor, sound editor, uh, supervising editor, mixer? You know, where, where are you? <laughs> I, I think the, the biggest um, advice I can give is to be open about your degree of experience. It's the, it's the, big, it's the best conversation in the world, starting from... Um, understanding what the person we're talking to understands already. And if we make assumptions, uh, we could be missing foundational things up front. 
you know, to help the conversation to drive that. You know, I might not be the fit for your show. And let's talk about that and why that is. And I a lot of cohorts that I can recommend that might be the fit, you know. So, not, you know, it's like, it's like a dentist. There are fantastic dentists out there, but not every dentist is for every patient, you know. So same, same thing goes. I, I've always had a, a vision in my head that most of my jobs came from cocktail parties. That it was one producer talking to another producer. If not a cocktail party, something similar. It was like, uh, who did you use on your last show? I really, really liked that show that you did, whether it's a television show or, or a feature film. Uh, who are you using on this and who are you using on that? And uh, I think that's it's our reputation that gets us jobs. So it's a building our reputation, just kind of like any industry. Uh, and then uh, they start to trust us. No, I'm not sure I can add anything to that other than uh, the networking aspect of it. Definitely, uh, you know, ask people that you trust, that you've worked with, as to who they might recommend for your project. And I get a variety of calls from any number of different kinds of films, different budgets. And just because I like the process, I work on anything at any time. It doesn't have to be some big Hollywood production for me to be excited about something. So um, don't think that someone who might have achieved a certain amount of credits wouldn't be interested in still working on what you have in hand. There's a variety of reasons why, why at least I accept certain films. You know, it's not always, for me, it's not always about the money. So. From, for production sound, I would say there's two things that, I mean, at least if I were looking for someone, and I feel like this is based on conversations with producers, but it's, I mean, yes, I have to be able to do good work. You want a production sound mixer who's going to turn in good tracks, usable tracks to the post team. Um, but it is very much, I think, also personality based. Is this someone that you want to work with that you think will work well with the rest of the crew for, you know, could be 14 hours a day, you know, five, six days a week? Um, it, personality is pretty important. Um, and so I think that's where sometimes I know that a lot of jobs like credits are important. I've handed out, you know, here's the link, to, here's my IMDb page. But a lot of the times it's, it's, a, it's an interview, it's a conversation with people. I think, and I'm sure that producers are talking to other producers about what was this, what was Amanda like on your show? You know, was she difficult? Was she problematic? <laughs> like, you know, those kind of things I'm sure are questions that are asked because when you are on set in, in close quarters, I mean, you want to work with someone that is able to get along with, with everyone else. So it's, yes, it's good work. It's the skill set, um, the problem solving set as well. But I do think personality matters a lot. And so I think that's something that you should be looking into because... You definitely, like you said, I mean, these are long hours that we do, and you want to be working with people that you can get along with at the end of the day, too. Everybody up here is the best. <laughs> um, speaking of being vocal, which I think is great advice for everybody in the room to say what you want and what you're looking for and what you have to offer, uh, let's open up to the audience for uh, Q&A. Do we have any questions for our, our panel here? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a question for Mike. And during COVID, did you have to do any remote review sessions with directors who couldn't come into your room? Or even when we didn't have COVID, I've supported directors and, and, uh, and producers with, with, with remote feed, feeds from the, from the dub stage. Well, personally, I did not. I know that people did. A lot of people did. But um, we kept our contact limited. Um, we just chalked that up as part of the pandemic experience. Uh, we were not going to have as many hours together as we would like. Um, some shows I just walked in on and we just started going. But they were repeat customers. They, they were friends. I knew them. They knew me. Uh, we could just sit down and get the job, you know, just bang it out, so, so to speak. And it, it worked okay. But I would imagine other people had a much more difficult time. Can I answer that as well? I had, I had an opposite experience, and I always am hesitant about mentioning it because we were very fortunate that Sony loved Ghostbusters so much. They, they wanted to keep us working through the entire pandemic. And uh, when so many people were suffering and, and looking for, for jobs, uh, th this film was supposed to come out in the summer of uh, 
2020, I think the June or July, and we ended up not coming out till November of 21. And what that afforded us with was being able to fine tune on a weekly, bi-weekly, sometimes three times a week Zoom meetings between editorial and the, and the, and the visual effects editors. We were all working together up in Burbank for two months and then we all shut down. Um, uh, the way I remember it is right after Kobe's helicopter. That, right after that happened, this seemed like the city shut down about a week later. And uh, we all moved home, and the Avids were set up, and we had all, the, all these meetings, both music meetings, pictorial meetings, everything was being done through Zoom, uh, and picture being sent through the internet, demos being sent, visual effects being changed. And because of that, that film ended up being, uh, I don't know, I, I think a lot better because of what it would have been having to try to compress that schedule into what it was originally, just by chance. Um, and so for us, being able to work remotely like that uh, worked in our favor. It, it's fortunate and unfortunate as you, as you can see why, you know. Can I throw in also? I think in, on an episodic side of things, I think we're in this hybrid version of that where all the parts of the process, spotting sessions, ADR sessions, the mixes, there's some component where we're prepared and have somebody monitor remotely. Um, it allows the producers to be in multiple places. We have multiple note, people coming in from, we've had people in their cars on their earbuds on an ADR session. Not ideal, but allow them to contribute, you know, which is what it's the goal as opposed to having to reschedule. So, you know, I can be in three cities in ADR sessions back to back um, at no cost to the producer because I'm, I'm doing it, up, well, besides my home kit, but from, from home remotely as opposed to drive, book one studio, all the talent's remote, book a studio and do a source connect session from one studio that has to then connect to three different ones. I'm doing that from home, and so it's only three studios, not three plus one. So that's that's fantastic. So, and then in the in the playback sessions, um, we it's pro I don't know if it's been a year and a half or two years since a network person has been on the mix stage. They're all remote, and that's and that's great because allows them to do multiple things in a day. Whereas before they'd have to take half their day out just to travel to the mix stage. So or half the producers are remote, and then some are in person. So it's a I think it's a great hybrid that allows contributors to be involved and not feel like they have to have a a surrogate for them on the stage, hoping they're fighting for their voice. You know, we're able to get everybody's voice. Uh, another question. Thank you. I would love to know which project are you most proud of and why? Uh, I, I, I can say uh, Black Hawk Down because it the picture was not supposed to come out until uh, uh, June of 2002 and in 2001 in September early September we we viewed the film with the uh, uh, the entire production staff uh, studio producer director um, and they loved it they loved that cut and they said it, uh, the studio executive said we, we don't have a f our Christmas release can you make this out for Christmas and I and they said well, they turned to me and said, can we do this for Christmas? And I said, uh, after 30 minutes of shock, I uh, said, yeah, we'll do it. Well, li it was literally 9 o'clock the next morning. Uh, then a, a team of about 60 sound editors and mixers all gathered together, and we pulled it off. We worked 56 straight days on two stages and, um, and, and 40 sound editors working. 56 straight days and we pulled it off and we got it done on on december 20th for a december 25th release i'm very proud of that but don't ask me to do it again <laughs> <laughs> and i would say for me because it's not like what your favorite film the, which is a different answer uh, for me it, it it has to be ray because that was a, a situation where I had been working with the director for many years and a relationship had been established. We started on Officer and a Gentleman. And by the time Ray came about, 
uh, it was second nature between the two of us. And for him to give me the opportunity to work with Ray Charles and, and Jamie Foxx and, and being there to be able to resolve issues for him on the set, like after two weeks of shooting, uh, you know, we need a new production sound mixer. <laughs> it wasn't quite working out. It was uh, not me. <laughs> I would say, where were you? Um, you know, this Friday night, find me a new sound mixer by Monday morning. Okay. <laughs> you know, and making calls to some uh, dubbing mixers that I respect. I did not call Mike. I don't know why I didn't call him. But I called some others, and I, and I got the name of uh, Steve Cantamesa, uh, called him. He had just finished a film, uh, miraculously, got on a plane, and he and his crew were there Monday morning. You know, being able to resolve issues like that on the set for the director and see through it all the way uh, through post um, and, and see our sound uh, mixers uh, win an Oscar for their role, uh, Scott Milan and I working uh, in, in depth together on the stage to deliver the sound that we thought Taylor would want uh, and accepted and he loved. Uh, so for me, Ray is probably uh, the one I'm most proud of that I'll look back on. I think I'm so happy I had that experience. Um, I, d I mean, I think same thing. There's, there's a lot of favorite projects too, but I know for sure one that I'm definitely proud of, specifically just because of the parameters of it were, um, you know, tricky, was Lady Bird. Um, I mean, it was, it was a low budget movie and so resources were really slim. So you really had to, I can tell you that for a fact that the entire crew was there because we wanted to be there for Greta to help tell that story. It was Greta's first feature as well. And I think a lot of us felt that weight as well, that we didn't want to let her down because we all loved the script so much. Um, but because resources were limited, both monetarily, you know, I mean, it was, the crew was a relatively small size. Um, but in my mind, that is the budget for fixing things in, in fixing things in post is going to be a lot more minimal than on any larger size budget film. So we really do want to get it there. We want to get it, you know, as best as possible. And, you know, Sir Sharonin giving such a phenomenal performance and Laurie Metcalf and Tracy Letts. I did not want to have to send those guys to an ADR booth. I mean, I, I just really wanted to do the best job possible. And we got to do some really fun things. I mean, Greta was very adamant. There's a musical scene um, where the, girl, the, the high schoolers are putting on a musical number, like a high school level musical. And she was very adamant. She did not want this to look like Glee. She wanted this to feel real and live. And that meant we were going to record everything live. And I, you know, had, had a bit of an uphill battle trying to convince them that not only was it possible to do this with multiple cameras, and yes, it will cut together even without a pre-recorded track, like I promise you this will work. Um, the day before we were scheduled to start shooting, the picture editor sent out a massive email to the producers and the director letting him know that he thought that my idea was not gonna work and he was you know, troubled by it and had to have a last minute calm everyone down I promise you this will work. I, I have done my research. I know that this will work. And as the picture editor got all the dailies in and started cutting it together, I got a, thankfully, a nice mass email sent out saying that he was absolutely wrong and that everything was working perfectly and you could cut it all together. Um, but that was great to get to watch that and know that it was all live and real. And that's what the director wanted. We didn't have to compromise simply because of budgetary constraints or, or you know, manpower restraints or any of that, that we were able to pull it off. Um, um, that, that felt really good to be able to do that because um, Greta was just a phenomenal director and to see her then her career sort of take you know off as well as a director it was really cool to, to get to be there at the beginning and I'm, I'm very proud of that and the work that that my team did on that as well I have a lot of sound babies that I love I mean how do you say one one baby is your favorite right <laughs> um, I think Elephant White is a, a feature with Kevin Bacon years ago and that's probably most creatively proud of because the, the sound design got, got to be featured so heavily because so much of our work, especially in features, um, from a sound design, sound effects standpoint, uh, dialogue is king, music um, is queen, and the sound effects are the court jester. And I'm not saying that lightly, just saying like in the priority of what has to tell the story, we have to be there to support it all, but I understand I got to get out of the way often. And so and then to be able to hear that work that I prepared, but was also fully prepared to never have the world even hear. But it had to be, I had to come with it, and just in case, to be elevated to where it was in the show. I really appreciated that, and I love that. But nobody saw it, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and then Marvel's The Gifted uh, was fantastic. We got to design 
the Fenres, mutant power was was one of the powers that had never been heard before. So what it's one of those times you get to tell the world what this has to sound like from now on. It's the lightsaber of, at that point, you know, the other superpowers had already been uh, to that point, or the mutant powers had been uh, exposed before, had never been heard before. So what does that sound like? So to get to, and that was a thing, time, relationship, spend time, lots of revisions, lots of back and forth well before the deadline um, helped us get there. And that was fantastic. Um, but then there's some administrative as a supervising sound editor, a large part of my job is administrative and, and coordinating teams um, and trying to make sure we hit the schedule that you guys give us. So um, I would say MacGruber, the most recent MacGruber series um, was administrative feat because it happened so fast. Um, it was the first show where I had uh, five effects editors and three, four dialogue editors all leapfrogging, continuously sharing episodes because it had to happen so fast. But to still creatively serve the story properly, um, even with a disparate team and, try and maintaining the continuity from episode to episode across multiple teams was um, plate spinning that I hadn't had to do before. And I just love that challenge. But that's, that's an example of um, a favorite project, but not necessarily because of what that soundtrack was. The soundtrack was still where I loved it. I wouldn't, there's nothing I necessarily would want to change because the, the creatives got what they were looking for and that was the goal. Um, but there's some other wins too, besides just something that sounds really great. John, I'd like to say something that that I've been listening to here, and it seems to be a, a theme that we all share, which is we need more time and more money. <laughs> uh, it comes down to, as a producer, you should not shortchange yourself. You should not you are storytellers. You should not change, shortchange the director. Tell your story properly. Give the production person the tools and the time that they need to set things up and record it properly. Give the music department what they need. Of course, they usually get it anyway. They, they get the fattest part of the budget. But <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. Sound editorial, they have to do their job properly because the focal point of all of our work is the mix. And you don't want to shortchange the mix. You want to get, you, you get to the mix and the producer and the director are going to say, well, where's this and why is this missing and why, why can't we do this? You don't want to put yourself in that situation where you can't deliver your story. So don't shortchange it coming to the mix because there's no remix later. We've got our, we have a, a, a drop dead date on the mix and you're not coming back to, you know, to fix it later. Even though you did say that in streaming, th that is done on occasion. That you will go back to an episode and fix it before it actually hits, goes out to stream. But that's pr uh, probably pretty rare, and it's probably it's minor, simple little changes. It can't be in the middle of an action scene. Well, and that's also very expensive. If we've delivered, and we get into re having to reproduce deliverables, especially when we're into Atmos, an Atmos digital file has to be redone you can't punch into an Atmos deliverable file. So if it comes back as we rush through, we missed, you know, QC notes come back and we got to fix stuff. Or in the hurry, that temp phone ring was in there. Like, Dang, that was supposed to come out. And then licensing so it comes back and says, oh, we got to swap out that phone ring. Um, that's a whole other round of deliverables. And that's a budget item. So, And that that happens sometimes because things are, are compressed in the schedule. We rush. Like if we can, I mean, what a difference two days makes between uh, when we think we have to mix and we really have to mix an extra two days of being able to decision make and let things evolve and let solutions appear can save a whole lot of money. Definitely. Um, Thanks for that. So we have one uh, have time for one last question. Uh, yes, in the third row on my right. I get you, Mike. Thank you. Um, this is for Amanda. Uh, I'm not a producer. I'm a supervising sound editor, and I think Brent will kind of back me up on this question. With the prevalence over the past 20 years of increased RF signals that interfere with the analog radio mics, including the radio booms, which I really hate radio booms, but this is a different question. Would you advocate to producers that they put in their budget the ability to upgrade to digital 
radio mics? I, I wouldn't simply because um, a sound mixer's kit, I mean, it's something that they've put together themselves. They're using equipment that they feel comfortable with. I mean, the, the, the cart that I've built is, is I was uh, talking to uh, earlier to Mike about this, but it's a bespoke cart that I have put together that I know every piece of it intimately. And so to have a producer dictate to me what type of equipment to use, I can tell you that most production sound mixers are going to laugh in that producer's face. I mean, but but I understand what you're saying. To me, the greater concern is, and I can tell you that most production sound mixers are very concerned with what you're talking about. RF issues, wireless issues are are not only get, they're, they've been around for a while, and they're not only, they're not getting better, they're getting worse. Um, and so it's about staying on top of that, because I don't want to turn in tracks that are unusable due to, um, you know, wireless issues. Um, what that means, though, is that a lot of production sound mixers out there are investing heavily in the latest and greatest technology, things that will keep us you know, able to work on set to use the wireless equipment um, that best serves the, you know, the environment to have it sound good. I mean, I can tell you that just personally, I just upgraded all of my wireless um, about six months ago, and that was a pretty hefty chunk of money. So the issue to me is that when I get on a show and I have a producer tell me we have X amount for your equipment rental, and that X amount is the same amount that production sound mixers have been getting for the past decade on shows. There's no accounting for the fact that we're all upgrading our kits constantly. We are constantly adding to it. I mean, I'm not going to drop numbers, but I own, I could own a very nice house in Los Angeles with the sound equipment um, that, you know, with, with what I've spent on my sound equipment. And so it's that understanding, I think, from from producer standpoint of if you give more money to your production sound mixer to cover that, like that's covering the cost of all of those upgrades, of the upkeep, of staying abreast of technology. So it's not so much about dictating specifics, you have to use this, but trusting that you've hired a production sound mixer who, trust me, has already thought of that. We've already, we've already invested. We've already upgraded. I mean, the system that I bought now... God, I wish I bought it a year ago. I mean, it's working so much better than the stuff I've been using before. We don't have the issues that, that you're describing. It's allowing us to use a wireless boom that is, is a viable, usable track um, and not having interference with the radio mics. But that, to me, is the bigger thing, is that looking at your budget for sound equipment and understanding what is what actually makes sense for what they're actually putting into it. I mean... I understand, you know, Panavision gives discount, the camera houses all give discounts too, but at the end of the day, you know what it costs to rent an Alexa package with a certain lens pack. Like, you know what that costs. It feels to me like the numbers for sound equipment have stayed stagnant for a really long time, and there's not an understanding about what we're actually spending to show up on set with the gear that gets the job done. Um, and it would be really nice to to sort of, sort of have that more of an open dialogue about, like, you know, it's great that you for the last five, ten years that you paid this for sound equipment, but sound equipment costs more money now. So you need to pay more money to get it to show up on set. That, that to me, is the, the bigger thing. It's not so much dictating brands, but I don't know. Any sound mixer worth their salt, they've put together a, a package, they've put together a cart that they, they've thought of all of that already. They're using the best top-of-the-line equipment, and that stuff doesn't come cheap, but they've chosen to invest in it because they want to turn in the best tracks possible. Please now pay us for it. <laughs> Well, and there's a lot of that, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, too, that the FCC sold off a lot of bandwidth that wireless gear was was using, and so the available <laughs> bandwidth is much more crowded. And you, I'm sure you have perfectly capable, top-of-the-line wireless gear that's actually illegal to use because of what the FCC did. So you have to upgrade. Yeah. It's not a... A lot of equipment a few years ago when T-Mobile bought that band of the spectrum, a lot of people owned, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gear that became completely illegal in the United States. All of that then had to be replaced out of the pocket of the production sound mixer. So that's when we say, when we go to you, you're going to go, oh, well, we've got 1800 a week for your sound package. And we're like, <laughs> oh, okay, you get one radio mic. I mean, that's, that's literally what it has to be. I mean, it's capitalism, right? You get what you pay for. Um, and I'm just asking for an honest conversation about what do things actually cost and can we actually start to, to pay people for what they've invested? Because I guarantee you, you will see dividends. You will, you will absolutely have less of, of issues on set if the production sound mixers are able to invest in the, in the correct gear. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not just simple of can't you use the old gear that's paid for. You actually can't. <laughs> All right, well, that wraps up our Sounds Like Success panel. Thank you so much to Amanda, Kurt, Mike, Brent for our panel today, for our audience here. And if you had a question that you didn't get to ask, uh, they may be around in the courtyard following the panel. So thank you so much, everyone.